46. We're singing verses 1 and 3. Love lifted me.
Thank you, Biggie. Good morning, church. I pray to you let your light shine. At what the scripture tells us, let your light shine before men. They may see your heavenly Father. Thank you. Appreciate that this morning. I never know what to say when people pray about something that is beyond my control. Uh, you see, you see fingers? Okay, turn them, put them to your face, pull up. <laughs> see, I like to see smiles on folks' faces. Man, if you had to look at what I look at every Sunday, no, not really. <laughs> I think y'all are, are a great group, and when I see people who uh, have come back, and it just breaks my heart feel good. Peggy, it's good to see you, Owen and Mickey, Loretta. Oh, wow. Well, you probably wonder, how does he know my name? Well, the Lord knows your name. It don't matter if I do or not, but I'm going to try. But it's glad to see everyone this morning. Okay, Bible's turn with me to Revelation as we continue in our study of the seven churches. Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. During the China Box Rebellion, uh, there's a lot of persecution going on among the churches, and one group surrounded a mission point, and there are 90 some folks there, and they blocked each gate. And then at one, they put a cross on the ground, and they said that if you'll trample this cross, we'll let you live. But if you don't, we'll shoot you. And so the first seven, because uh, it, it's fearful to think about, even in our world today. If someone come in this fellowship and said, if you don't deny Christ, yeah, I'm going to shoot you. Isn't that something to think about? Where would we stand in that? And so we find the first seven as they uh, trampled the cross for fear of their life. But then there's an eighth, a student, who neither feared man and was faithful to Christ and she walked around it, and she was shot on the spot. And because of her courage, the others, they were able to do the same. Folks, it's important today to realize that we need to take a stand. If you're a Christian, you need to speak up, stand up, and you need to show forth who your allegiance is to. We have been quiet too long. I'm thankful for the revival that's going on in Asbury College. You know what was the forerunner of that revival? Prayer. People, we need to be people of prayer. You need to pray. You need to believe in your prayer. Because I believe God's at work. And all revivals and great awakenings throughout our world were started because of prayer. If you want to see something mighty happen in your life, in your family, in Clover Baptist Church, pray. Pray and believe that prayer. Say, I'm going to answer the prayer. That's how come I can't do no other. I can't do no other but to tell Jesus I love you and to show people I love them. See, it's hard sometimes. Some people are hard to love, but we need to love them in Christ. See, people don't know that. See, they think people are just out what they can get from them. I'm not out to get anything from you. I just want you to know Jesus. And that's what John, you know, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And, you know, for preaching the gospel, some say he was boiled in oil before he went. But, you know, through his commitment and his uh, stand for Christ, God rewarded him with the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking at tonight. I believe the Spirit is working. He's working in our midst. And he's trying to say something to us. Are you listening? You know, so many people have listening problems, you know. It's not only be doers, uh, uh, hearers only, but doers of God's word. And so as we think together this morning, Smyrna, the persecuted church, one of seven, and these were actual churches, but I think also it could be in uh, individual Christians' attitudes as well as churches, it's not just past, but it can be present and as well as future because we know God is speaking. God's speaking. Will you stand with me as we reverence God's word? 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews or not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be t tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. But thou faithful, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. May God has rich blessing, reinterpretation word. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we come boldly to the throne of grace because of Jesus, because of his love, because he showed our love on a cruel cross, that he not only died, but he rose again, is interceding for us on behalf of the Father. It's good that we have a God who loves, a God who shows that love. God help us as a people that we would be that, that we would be that for one another, we would be that for this community, for this country, and for this world. We're thankful for the revival that's going on. We know these are preludes of your second coming. Pray that revival would continue to spread. Let it begin each and every one of our hearts. May we be excited because of Jesus. And I pray for these who've come today, Lord, that you just give us open eyes, open ears, open hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. Hide this man behind the cross that uh, people may see Jesus and hear Jesus. And also may those who are hearing by way of, of uh, online that they might also receive blessing for it. We all face uncertainties and troubles and trials in our lives. But Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful in all things. Help us to be faithful as well. We pray for those who may be lost today who don't know Jesus. Help them to know there's only one way, and that's through Jesus. And may they be saved today, God. Go with us now, and when we leave this place, may we say it was good to be in house, Lord, today. For us in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We find last week that we talked about a church, Ephesus. It was a beautiful uh, place uh, that had been founded, and it was like the gateway to Asia, and we find that it had a lot of good things going forward. It was stamping out all kind of evil and stamping out all kind of things, but the fact remains their motivation had gotten off. They were doing it out of duty rather than devotion. We need to be careful when we approach people that when we share what they're doing may not be what they ought to be doing. They need to know it's motivated by love. It's not out of hate. Brother, I love you. That's why when I ask people, do they know Jesus? I say, it's because I love you. You know, I want you to know him. And we need to learn that sometimes people, we can get loveless in our lives. We need to know our motivation needs to be pure, and even though it can't be always, but we need to show it through love, as I hope many of you did. And I had to apologize last week. I said, Valentine's Day was an important day. No. Any time, uh, birthday, anniversary, whatever, you need to show love. See, my wife, she's good at that. See, I say things sometimes that I know what I mean, but I don't want you to misunderstand. But it's important for us to take any opportunity, every opportunity to tell your spouse or your children or others that you love them. I don't want a day go by. I don't want them, if something happened to me, the last thing I pray they hope they hear or remember is that I love you. Because I tell you what, that can cover a multitude of sins. It can, it does. But as we move from Ephesus, we come to the second church of the seven churches, which was around the first century to maybe the third century B.C. in church history. And this was a, a place that was up a little bit north and toward the coast. And you know how we like to coast, don't we? There's not many of us don't like to go to the beach and we don't like to look out over the the uh, ocean, and man, it's just an um, amazing creation of God. I remember the first time I saw the beach, I was 18 years old. Some of you think, man, that's old. But we just didn't go to the beach when I was growing up. No. And so I remember I was at Fort Casual, <clears throat> and we was up on top of the fort. And I remember that evening, that first Vesper we had up there, they had Vespers back then up on the fort. And as the preacher was preaching and talking, I just looked around and I said, my, what an amazing world we have. 
If there, if people don't believe there's a God, they need to do that. They need to look out. And I just thought how amazing that was, you know, how God created such a beautiful world and all. And so as you think about Smyrna, it was a, a, a city. It, it was planned. It was built by Alexander the Great, and then it was destroyed, but then it was built back into different colonies. And when you look at it from the coast, you find that it... it goes up. Just like in North Carolina, we start at the coast, and the further west you go, it climbs, and it climbs. And I thought I was at the highest point when I went to a certain part of the mountain, but there's still a higher part. <laughs> but to them, it looked just like a crown. You know, the whole layout of the city of Smyrna. And so it became known as the crown of Asia. It was known for many things. It was loyal to Rome, to the emperor, because their slogan was, Caesar is Lord. Even though there was a church there, but many of them had come to the point where they were so loyal to their government and everything. And folks, you need to pray for your government, but you don't need to put government above your relationship to Jesus. You need to obey God rather than man. And I think that's what's happening in, in our society. And I think government's trying to, and don't, don't, boy, I'm saying it on air, but it's true. Government was wanting to try to control us. And we need to realize government don't have no business controlling people. We're not a socialist society. We are a democracy, and we ought to obey God rather than men. And so we find in Smyrna there was this element that was, was present. And then also they were a good uh, uh, place for making a lot of money. It was a lot of guilds like our unions today. And they had these all around. And sometimes, as we'll see in a little bit, if you become a Christian, they would ostracize you. And you know what that would do? That would hurt your living, your income. And so as we find they, even though they had a lot of good things going for them, but they had many things, as, as we'll see in our scripture today. But as we see the introduction here, as each letter has a description of Jesus in them. And it was written, as it said, to the angel. And we said the angel was a bishop or, or a pastor and even a you know, messenger you know, from God. But anyway, it was given to someone so that they in turn can give it to the people. That's why when we gather each Sunday... You need to pray for your pastor, your son to school, you know, the folks, because God's given them a message and they're to present it, you know, to you. And so, and then not just uh, present it, but prayerfully that you will listen and you will, you will obey what the scripture tells us. The word of God is the word of God. And so we find here that the message was coming and it described Jesus as it says in uh, verse Eight, the first and the last. You know, that is a beautiful description of Christ as it goes back to Revelation 1 where it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So you see, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last uh, letter. I learned that in college and seminary. And I tried to learn all that was in between too. But there's Alpha and there's Omega. And it means the beginning and the end. So there was nothing before God, and God will always be. As Jesus was beginning, and Jesus is in. He's there. And as he is our intercessor. Isn't it great to have someone who is talking on our behalf? I love it when people intercede for me. Maybe somebody may blame me for something. Somebody will step up and say, I know him. I know he couldn't have done that. See, you need somebody who stands up with you. My wife will. I tell you, but you don't have to worry about me if you accuse me or something. You about get by her to get to me. <laughs> Christian, we should never, ever realize, think we're alone in what we go through, what we face. Jesus is with us. He said he would. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So that's a promise we have here. And so the one who is speaking to this church or to the church yesterday is one who has always been 
and one who it always will be. And then it goes on as it says here that uh, I was dead but am alive. See, Christ was crucified. See, Christianity is the only religion and all that can make that claim. I, can't, I can take you to the place where they buried Christ, but I can't say Christ is buried because he's alive. We serve a risen Savior. No other religion can make that claim. You can take a person to where they're buried, and you know what? They're still there. Jesus is not. So that's one blessing that we have as children of God. We serve a risen Savior. He's alive. Can you say that? He's alive. See, that's why I have a smile on my face. Because he's alive. And he lives in me. He lives in me. And he can live in you if you let him. You don't ever have to feel like you're alone. Even so, sometimes we do. So he's Alpha Omega. He's first and last. He was dead, but now he's alive. And you know what? You're never more alive. And you know what a saint is? It's the one who, who Christ is alive in. So, we got a lot to be joyful about. And so, as we find the next thing is there's no condemnation in this church. In that, this is the only church of the seven that there's no condemnation. You might wonder, how in the world can that be? Well, it's when you trust in the Lord, when you love Him, and when you serve Him with all your heart. You know, even though none of us are perfect, it doesn't mean this is a perfect church. Like I told you, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. I think a lot of people are looking for that church, but let me tell you something, it don't exist. See, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Even this preacher, I said, the only reason I'm up here is where they built this thing. I'd rather be down there. That don't mean I'm higher than y'all. I'm just... Saved by grace, called by God, and surrendered to Him. You know. And so none of you ever ought to think you're up here. You're not up here. We're on level ground. We're on level ground. I hate to burst people's bubbles. You know that? I say, you ain't good as you think you are. <laughs> I know some preachers, they can be that way. But you know, it's your fault sometimes because you give us the big head. When we go out the door and you say, man, that's the best sermon I ever heard. I said, man, you must not have heard me any. <laughs> uh, but anyway, as we come to the commendation, that's one thing, you know, it's thankful there's no condemnation, but look at verse 9. As he says, I commend you for certain things and the word he uses here, he says, I know. I know. And if anyone knows, it's God. See, God knows you. And you know, I think people are afraid for someone to know them. They do. They're afraid. They'll let you get so close. But that's it. It's sad that you miss out on a lot of good stuff when you build a wall. I'm going to let you come so far. See, couples have not learned that intimacy is a beautiful thing. God created us, male and female. He created us to grow in love with each other. And you know what? They'll love you regardless. They know you're not perfect. I know when you, are first, when you first meet. How wonderful you think he or she is. My wife used to say, you know, marriage is like a pair of glasses. You don't see a person like they are when you when you just dating or when you talking on the telephone. But it's when you live day in and day out when all the mask and all the stuff comes off. Well, I knew a lady that she never let her husband see her without makeup. And she wouldn't mind me saying that because that's just the way she was. She just didn't want her husband to see her without makeup. 
And one time in it, she had surgery. You know, I always used to go before to have surgery, you know. And you know, when you have surgery, you can't put makeup on, I don't think. But anyway, uh, I asked her, I knew how she was, and I said, uh, do you want me to come see you? And she said, why, yes. So she let me do something her husband couldn't, didn't do. You know. But anyway, the idea, as we see here, as you know, God knows you. I don't know why people don't like that. Isn't it wonderful that God knows you? He knows you inside and out, and He loves you. He loves you. Just as I committed to my spouse, to my children, my grandkids, and to whoever God puts in my life. See, I'm going to love you regardless, and that's what he did on Calvary. See, he looked out over that crowd, and you know, you have done the worst, but I still love you. And I want you to know today, there's nothing you can do that God wouldn't love you. Now, he's forgiven you if you'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you know, there's a lot of good things that were going on in the church at Smyrna. He classified it in three ways. He says, I know your affliction, I know your poverty, I know your slander. You know, Jesus gave a pretty hard call to us as followers. I think most people forget that. You know, he told his disciples early on, he said, if you come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. I really believe that most people don't realize that's not easy. It's not easy. Because we live in a selfish society. You think about it. We do. You look around, it's all about me. Let me, have, let me give you a clue. It's not about you. As a child of God, it's about him. It's not what I want, it's what he wants. And somehow the, the Christian that's murdered they got a hold of that. You know, it's wonderful when you get a hold of that to know that God loves you regardless. And he never said it's going to be easy to follow him. I mean, we in America have been so blessed. We have. We are so blessed. But if we don't realize who and what that, see, we've lost a lot of the things that our forefathers planted and started in this country. It's because we stood by and allowed it to happen. People don't think they can pray or they can, can uh, read the Word of God or, I mean, go to church. There'd be people in other countries would yearn, would, would, would love to be able to come to a church. They got to go underground, they got to hide, they got to, or they might be killed because of the gospel. We're so fortunate in America. That's why we need to always focus, we need to pray, we need to speak up, speak out. That's not being narrow-minded, it's biblical-minded. That's what we need. And so the church at Smyrna, they were faithful. The word affliction means crush under weight. See, sometimes if somebody just says a cross thing to us, when we may express faith, we may clam up. But there will come a day, and I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom and gloom, but if we don't start and we don't speak up, speak out and all, there might be a day when we might... And we do see churches closing all the time. Now, COVID did a number on churches. You see, we need to not let the affliction or sickness or anything hinder us from gathering, from being his church. You see, the affliction that the Smyrna folks were going through was a fact, as we'll see in a moment, even as the devil was inflicting harm, you know, upon them. And, you know, it's the idea that affliction can come from within as well as without. Even in churches, 
whenever there's conflict. We need to be on guard because when you think about persecution, look at early church. You remember when uh, they were growing by leaps and bounds. They were winning folks and they were discipling believers. But yet, in chapter 6, we find there was murmuring. Don't you like people who murmur? Mur mur you have a lot of murmurers in church. I don't always hear them, but God does. When people don't get their way or they don't get their thing or they don't get, hey, it ain't about you. Let me again emphasize this. It's God's church. It's not my church. It's not your church. And the devil will try to do it from within first. He tried to do it among the widow women. You remember Acts chapter 6? The Grecians were murmuring against the Hebraic women, uh, the, his talent to disciples. Oh, they're getting preferential treatment. They're getting more than we're getting. Hey, it's funny what money can do to people. Money should always be a measure by which we use for God's glory, not for ours. God gives to us so we can give to others, you see. And so we find the devil used it within first. And it did cause some, some ruffles, and it will. It'll cause ruffles. But we find that they were able to weather the ruffle <laughs> because what they did, they formed a committee, which that's what happens in Baptist churches a lot of times government does the same thing. You know, there's a lot of things die in committees. You should never let anything die, y'all. If y'all got something in committee, don't let it die. You need to discuss it. You need to, to bring it about and bring it back. So the church is the final say. You know that? You're the final say. Okay? And so what happened is that the devil tried to destroy the church from within. Don't ever allow the devil to do that. You are children of God. And don't listen to him. Determine is this what I want is what God wants. Okay? And then, of course, the external, you know, divisiveness that can happen. You know, it's sad, though, that there are people out here, and, and you're going to face them. Our young people, children, are going to face them even more as time goes on. That's why we need to instill in our young people and our children. They need to believe God. They need trust in Jesus. They need to live for Him. They need to stand up for Him, speak for Him, not be ashamed. We need not be ashamed. Because I think of, of all the millions. Now, there were five million they recorded in the first few centuries that were persecuted and killed for the gospel. And you don't hear that much today. But there's going to come a time we're going to see more of that. If you stand up for Jesus, if you testify of him, and, and you say, I ain't going to move or do this, it may cost you your life. It may cost you your life. And so what happens here is that it's not easy to be a child of God. It's not easy to be a Christian if you're truly surrendered, if you're truly living for him. How many times have we not spoke up? when something was said in a group or in it. You realize you're not alone. You and God's the majority. And God will give you the strength. You need to be that one. Because there's so much out there and so much that people are allowing to take hold of their lives. Are you living for Jesus? Are you living for the world? See, so there's going to come afflictions in their lives and we need to be honest and honor him. And then another thing is poverty. As I said in Smyrna, there were guilds, and you had to belong to one in order to have a business, you know, to make money. But there was many, when they found they were Christians, they ostracized them. And you know what? When you don't have a business, how are you going to take care of your family? How are you going to provide? How are you going to make a living, you know, for others? And see, sometimes... We don't need to allow government to, we don't need to be entitled to government. Because when you're entitled to government, you have to do what they say. People better not say, well, you get government. I said, no, I don't. I get Social Security. I paid into that. I earned that. Government ain't giving me nothing. The government takes away. They don't give. 
even though they try to convince you of that. We don't need to be dependent on government. We need to depend on God. God provides. Lord, people are going to go out here thinking that preacher is anti government I'm not anti-government. I believe we ought to support and pray for our government. But when they cross the line, that's where I speak up. Because what was happening in Smyrna was, you know, many of the Christians were poor. They, they, it seemed like it appealed to poor people. You know, Abraham Lincoln said one time, God must have loved poor people because he made so many of us. <laughs> but you know what? To be honest today, you're not poor. You know, when I was growing up, I had all my knees met. I did. I mean, I was really blessed to be brought up. I mean, we lived in a four-room house, seven of us. And we had clothes on our back. We always had food. We eating biscuits. Hey, we had them. We are better off than some of other folks. I didn't know I was poor until I went to school when I started comparing to other kids. But you know what John says as, as Jesus gave him this letter? He says, I know your poverty. But see, the thing about it is people think of poverty in a lot of different ways. Because if you think about your life, many of us are really rich. Do you know why so many people want to come to America? Because it's a land of opportunity. When you had to live like the, the folks that are trying to get in our country, I would think, yeah, they think he was rich. I even worked with the Israeli boy in college, and man, he had an a idea. I, he, he looked at me, he said, you know, I learned growing up that all Americans are rich. I said, what? I said, you better come back here. I said, I don't know where it's at. But the thing, if we're honest today, is we are. And the Smyrna Christians, even though they were poor, even some of them were having a difficult time making ends meet, but it's said that they were rich because they knew Jesus. You see, it ain't the size of your bank account that makes you rich. It's like a boy used to text me every Saturday and says, we're blessed, too blessed to be stressed. Do you know that today? You and I, we're too blessed to be stressed because everything we receive is from God. Did God say he'll meet your needs? He didn't say he'll meet your wants. And I have all. I don't need anything. You need to get to that place in your life that I have all I need. When you have Christ, he's all you need. I don't put my trust in things because you know what? Those things will disappear. Have you ever seen a hearse behind, a U-Haul behind a hearse yet? I don't know why people think they're going to take it with them. I mean, there's things that, yeah, that, that we can send on ahead. Those things that we, we uh, love and, and trust, the folks we share gospel with, you know, there's things that are going to go ahead before us, but they're not silver or gold or things. You know, they're more lasting. Know that I have a home in heaven. That's all the riches I need. I might have old shanty down here, but I got a mansion on the hilltop. And so today, as we think about commendation, they were, com they were commenting on their affliction, their poverty, and then lastly, slander. And you know, slander is... is, is uh, taking a truth and making a falsehood out of it. And when you slander somebody, you're, you're you know, uh, slandering their name or, or position or whatever. But the Christians are a most misunderstood group of people. I mean, if you don't understand the language, people can misunderstand what we stand for, what we teach. It's just like there are six areas in the early church you know, that they, that they talked about or practice. One was the sacrament. You know, they took the Lord's Supper often, and they talked about his body and blood. And you know what the world thought? That they were cannibals. They thought Christians were cannibals. You could see why. 
They talked about Jesus' body and his blood, but they didn't realize that's not the physical, that's spiritual. See, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we're identifying with Christ. We're taking his, you know, uh, the, the bread is his body and the cup is his blood. It symbolizes his sacrifice for us. And then the second thing, the common meal is called agape feast, which we do, we had this last Saturday. Many of them thought that was a time of orgies. Christians were sexually minded, not realizing that they were people who loved God. Who loved God. And then a third thing was that Christianity split families. Well, Jesus said in those days that there will be, you know, father and mother and children, there will be some hatred and separation, but it does, in fact, when you're a Christian, your child's not, there is going to be a kind of a separation. In, in the Muslim world or any other religion, if they accept Christ, they're ostracized. You've heard that testimony from folks who, it, call, it really costs them to accept Jesus because they have to separate, their family separates from them. It'd be hard, wouldn't it? not be able to go home or talk to you, brothers, sisters, or mother and dad. But it's not the fact that Christ separates because Christ don't separate. He unites. See, he may take you from your physical family, but he makes you a part of a spiritual family. That's why I say church should be important to an individual Christian because we're part of the family of God. Clover is part of the family of God, the whole church. And we need to love each other. We need to help each other, be there for each other. And so it's not the fact of it's unity. It should be unity. And then they call Christians atheists because they don't have an idol to worship. See, we worship God who is spirit and truth. We don't need an image to, to have before us. We need to know that God is a spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's like I told people one time, I don't, know to, I don't have to know all there is about electricity, turn the light switch on, or know a lot about a car, I might be walking. See, you won't know all there is about God, but you can. You have his word, you have prayer, and you have others that you can share with. And then another thing is that they were accused of being politically disloyal because they would never say Caesar is Lord because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And the last thing quickly is that they were accused of being incendiaries because they preached to hell, a fire. And folks, you don't hear much about today, but there's two places people go, heaven or hell. If you're a believer, you go to heaven. If you don't, Go to hell. And I don't mean that in the rock toy sense. But that's just the truth. And then the last thing we want to look at quickly is exhortation. Verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which you suffer. You see, a lot of people, they don't want to suffer, but we know if we're going to be obedient, if we're going to be children of God, it, it may come you know, to us. And because the devil is, is at work, he goes through many things, and today he's going through social media like you would not believe. That's why you need to be on guard. You need to watch what your children are watching. Don't you let them just get in there all by themselves. You need to be there. You need to know what they're watching. Because the devil can come in. I mean, just as easy as everything. See, it's like anything that starts out good, but the devil can turn it on you. It'll cause you to see things and think things, and just like pornography, a man doesn't start out being addicted. But all you got to do is just stare. I mean, it's not a sin to look. It's what you do with that look. It's what you do with that look. And so I want to challenge you today, you know, know what you're watching and, you know, be sure that what you're watching is of God. And, you know, you have to be careful because of all these things. And then he says we need to be faithful unto death. We're going to suffer for a time, but it's only for a time. And I like what it says, if you overcome, you will receive the crown of life. And you know, in those days, it's part of the games. They had a, a, a uh, 
uh, thing where they run races and the winner would receive a crown. It's just like all of us. We like to receive uh, trophies. We like to receive uh, plaques. We like to receive things for a job well done. As a Christian, uh, you will receive the crown of life, which is eternal life, knowing that this is all there is. But you know what's the beautiful thing about it? You look at Revelation, even if we get the crown, you know what we're going to do as Christians? We're going to cast them at Jesus' feet because only he is worthy. Only Christ is worthy of honor, glory, and praise. Not me. I'm not worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Only he is worthy. And I like as he closes out that we don't have to, as Christians, we don't have to be afraid of the second death. If you look at Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the great white throne judgment. The books are going to be open. If your name's not written in the book of life, then you'll be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Christians, you don't have to worry about it because you won't be in that judgment. Because your book's written, your name written. You don't even have to face that second death. And yet, second death is that lake of fire. That's total separation from God. So today, we have hope. We have hope because we're his children. And I pray today as we think about, well, how does this speak to me? Just think about how important it is, you know, as, as a Christian that you need to stand up, speak out, you know, for Christ. See, we're to be his witnesses. We're to be his witnesses. So are we a poor, rich church or are we a rich, poor church? It depends on where you put Christ, where you put in Christ. Blessed is he. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Father, we're just thankful for the way that you teach and the way you share through letters as you did to these seven churches. Lord, may it speak to us as individuals, as families, as a church. Help us to be found faithful. Because we know those who persevere to the end will win. God, help us to be overcomers. Father, no matter what we've done in our life, help us that we might look to you, lean on you, and believe you. That as we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we pray today that you be with each one. As we go from this place, that we would truly share a word a witness in our walk, in our talk. Thank you for this fellowship. Bless in our invitation time for one who needs to come to accept your Savior, be baptized in the fellowship. Help us to identify as we continue in this way. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn and invitation this morning is turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen.